puisse venir de l'argent. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to do is ask our panel to give a quick introduction of themselves, so that be the name and the organization that they represent. And after that, we'll open the room up for questions. I'll try to take three questions at a time. The panel will then be able to choose amongst themselves who's best suited to answer that question. Before you ask a question, please wait for a microphone to reach you. There are microphones around the room. There are runners that will come and bring that microphone to you. Please stand, give your name, and also the organization that you work for, and then I will take down your question. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to our panel for our initial introduction. Thank you. My name is Gift Simwaka. I work for an investment bank, which is uh, based in Dubai, Faber Capital. And I'm greatly associated with Zimbabwe. I've been doing banking transactions for over eight years, very successfully. And I would like to see most of you come through. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Ross Matangi. Um, I've worked on Wall Street as a derivatives trader uh, for the better part of 17 years now um, at two large uh, American investment banks uh, and now currently at a Swiss bank. Um, with that, uh, I, I, I find it very um, uh, optimistic, um, the things that I'm hearing and the discussions that I've been having so far. Uh, with all of you um, and looking for ways uh, to sort of uh, approach some of the, the challenges with investing in Zimbabwe um, from a financial market perspective and bringing some of the um, institutional knowledge that we have in the developed markets into the emerging market. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kamlovac, Stuart Kamlovac. I'm a special advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Trade of Zimbabwe, who was uh, supposed to be with us on this delegation, but unfortunately was indisposed and couldn't, and couldn't make the, the trip. But I've been there for about four, four or five months now, and before that in the office of the President and Cabinet, and before that for about 40 years in the Z Zimbabwean Foreign Service. Thank you. Thank you, Herbert Ngala. I'm the one who just gave you a powerful speech uh, two minutes ago. <laughs> uh, I chair uh, Zimbabwe Best Businessman, uh, chair in uh, three companies, uh, one in financial services, another one in retail, another one in tourism. I'm here representing the listed companies of Zimbabwe. Uh, Edwin Manikai, um, I'm a founding partner uh, in a law firm called DMH. Uh, the law firm, uh, one of uh, only four band one ranked law firms for business in Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm also uh, one of only four uh, band one uh, ranked lawyers uh, for business. Uh, we represent uh, uh, large corporates, uh, international financial institutions, uh, on uh, doing business uh, in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, last year, working with the man to the extreme right, Gift Sumwaka, um, in 2018, uh, we turned over transactions uh, for AFREX in excess of $1.6 billion. Uh, so we understand the marketplace, uh, its dynamics, and how best to secure uh, your investments uh, from a financial uh, point of view. Uh, we also work very well with regulators uh, across the <coughs> board. Um, I've been practicing in the country, admitted to the bar, and I'm still at it for 33 years. Um, so you are sure that we can get uh, uh, as much cooperation from regulators as uh, is, uh, is uh, feasible. Um, the minister here to my immediate left uh, is probably one of my largest clients uh, uh, through the central bank um, and, and even before. Uh, so you will be in good hands if you find me, I will find you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I already introduced myself. <laughs> uh, Glenn Cohen, I'm a private equity investor. Uh, currently, we're working in Zimbabwe under Love Frontiers, which I chair, um, and Zim Borders. 
Uh, it's a logistical infrastructure uh, initiative. Um, I come from the logistical space and uh, I'm pleased to be back uh, looking at business opportunities in Zimbabwe. Well, I've uh, already introduced myself, but maybe just a repeat commercial to say um, I'm here because of Zimbabwe and I'm here because of you. Uh, if there are any issues that we need to follow up, uh, we are ready to do our business as a Zimbabwe mission in Geneva. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Honorable Tenba Peter Mleso. I'm a member of parliament. I chair the Committee of Mining and Mining Development. I'm the only one to beat the ruling party and the opposition. In fact, it was not a beating, it was a thumping. <laughs> With 17,000 votes, the MTC Alliance 7 and me 4,000. I'm the only legislator back to back to be an independent member. Before I contested in this election, I was independent. Then I also stood independent. So you've got one of the few people who can ask the minister questions without being expelled from the party. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for those very exciting introductions. Um, and just for those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Christopher Dielman. I'm a senior economist at Exotics Capital, and I'm a former uh, staff member at the IMF, where I was the head of debt sustainability modeling. So obviously, we're now going to open the floor up to questions. But being the MC of today's event, obviously, I have a very special privilege of controlling the microphone at the moment. And with that, I won't be missed to ask a few questions on, on my own. Um, so these questions are directed at the minister. And I apologize in advance if these are the tough questions, but I think these are really the questions that a lot of investors have on their mind. And it's hard to look at the situation in Zimbabwe now, or really over the last 10 to 15 years, without talking about inflation. Obviously, the official inflation rate in Zimbabwe is about 2, 2.5%. It's anchored nominally by official inflation in the US, but clearly that is not the case that's on the ground. There are rising prices across the country. There are differentials between prices that are being charged in hard currency versus RTGS. We can unofficially track inflation through the old mutual implied rate, for those of you who are unaware of that. Um, and I was wondering if that is something that you could address, because I think a lot of investors would really like to see your take on the matter and some guidance on how you hope to correct this. And a follow-on question, um, some of you may have seen the minister's interview on Bloomberg TV this week, where you talked about potentially introducing a new currency within the next 12 months. Obviously, that would be one way that you could try to tackle inflation by actually bringing tight monetary policy back to the country. The question is, is that something that's feasible, given the lack of reserves at the moment and sort of the lack of credibility in terms of the budget? Obviously, we've seen a tremendous improvement since the new administration is coming, but what are the further actions that you think are needed to really tackle both of those issues? <clears throat> Thank you. Is this one? Yeah. Uh, this, 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 this is good. Um, I mean, first of all, let's look at the, the causes of inflation in the first place. So what has, what has happened in this uh, period of disequilibrium, to use a very big economics word, uh, in, in the last 20 years is that the, the, the domestic liquidity has risen quite a bit. Uh, at the moment, it's measured through what we call the RTGS balances and the stock of bond notes in circulation. And, and, and what, what the reason for the growth in these domestic balances had it, was linked to the budget deficit. Uh, uh, basically, this is the public record. In, if we recall in the past, uh, in the month of July and August uh, 2018, we um, had a, a, a deficit for those two months alone was actually $1.3 billion, just for two months. Uh, so quite clearly, the government expenditure was the reason why there's a growth in the domestic balances of money supply equivalent, and that potentially had to uh, could, could ignite infection, inflation. But then, what, but then what led to the realization that we had a problem? Because in the past, it's like we had a, a boiling pot, it had a lid on it. Uh, when was the lid uh, lifted off for us to see that we had something uh, not so nice down there? Was on the 1st of October when we uh, introduced or rather separated the foreign currency accounts uh, into a hard US dollar and other TGS FC accounts, which created the impression, clearly, realization that with large uh, domestic liquidity sloshing around, and then that, that touched then the, 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 
grossing the premium uh, in, the, in the other market. Actually, I, I, I'll just call it the other market. So that premium then led to price speculation where uh, uh, you know, retailers were holding back you know, the Coca-Cola, rice, and so forth, uh, and so forth, and then causing shortages, and then further price increases. It's a typical uh, speculative uh, process that, 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 that took place. And that's what really uh, triggered inflation. But, that the, but, but the action of the 1st of October was not the cause. The cause was already there. It was just waiting to happen, just waiting to happen, simmering below the, 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 the surface. So, so that, that's, that's, that's the trigger point. Uh, so the, the, therefore it also means the solution to dealing with it is to keep the fiscal front tight to make sure that the, the budget deficit doesn't run away and continue to be a cause and drive of liquidity, domestic liquidity, and, and hence uh, inflation. You're right that because we only work on one leg of fiscal policy, we don't have monetary policy to deal with. We are trying, because we have no domestic currency. So the way we did it again on the 1st of October was to increase, uh, was to introduce a, a reserve requirement uh, that 5% of the liquidity uh, of the deposits in, by the banks had to be surrendered uh, to the central bank. There would be sterilized, a sterilization process. Uh, and, and also, partly the 2% the uh, financial transactions tax is also one of those sterilizers, by the way. And the third is the savings bond that the central bank has been running for a while, just increasing that. Uh, and also increasing the tenure of, uh, of, uh, of uh, these savings bonds, lengthening the duration. All those are tricks to really deal with the uh, liquidity aspects. And switching to the, to the, to the currency more directly, it's quite clear that uh, with this kind of uh, 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 uncompetitive environment, we need to deal with the external value of our currency and the domestic currency is the way to go. I did say earlier that it is costly for Zimbabwe to use the US dollar. I actually did some very rigorous work uh, uh, which was what I used to do uh, for a living a few years ago, which has been an academic, on, on how Zimbabwe has lost competitiveness <coughs> by using the US dollar. It's costing us $1.5 billion a year to use the dollar as both as a reserve currency and a transaction currency. Surely that has to be expensive. And if we don't reform, the dual currency reform now, we won't do it for another 10 years. But let me be honest, uh, if we miss the vote now, then we get into election mode. Even I want to stand this time around, right? <laughs> but once we're in election mode, we don't want to do crazy things. Then we get into populist mode. Let's be honest about that's the nature of the game. Kemba is an expert, you know, on, on this. So, 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 and then, then we do nothing, because why? That's the difficult stuff. So if we're going to do difficult stuff, we do it now in the first two years. We just have to walk the talk or not. So, so, so that's about, about that. But we're purely aware that we need to build the the right, right uh, uh, you know, uh, foundation for a, a stable currency, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, to make sure that it gives credibility. People believe in it as a store of value. I know that uh, they said, oh, minister, please move faster and remove the bond note, the surrogate accounts that have been using to, to patch up the liquidity challenge, move faster. You even said that before you appointed, you don't do that, you remove this thing, but let me tell you what, you know, the, you, you have to replace it with something else, that something else costs money. Uh, or it, it suggests that maybe we replace it with the rand. But you know, if you're going to replace bond notes with rand, you need US dollars first. And then you buy the rands, then you hand over those rands to the to US holding. So what are you doing? You end up with, with, with the same uh, uh, problem. So, 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 and think about it, there's an issue of divisibility for, for rural folk who don't have access to mobile banking. Uh, all they know is bond coins and bond notes. What do you do with them? Where government? We cannot ignore uh, uh, people in rural areas to just to support a, a section of, of, our, of our economy, of our population, where we, we have to... to, to uh, so that's why it's taking us longer to do what we know eventually we will do, and I'm using, I'm emphasizing the word eventually, so I don't give a date. Um, so then, yeah, so that's, that's basically about currency. Uh, I don't know how I've covered uh, a good part of it. If you, if you haven't, obviously, there's a room full of the angry mob might turn against you. But hopefully that answered everyone's, everyone's question. And uh, let me be the first to say that I think it's refreshing to hear the administration realize the acute challenges that you face and are putting plans in place to actually try to tackle that. So obviously this won't be an e easy road ahead, but it's nice to hear that you're moving forward on it. So with that, let's open the room for some questions. Uh, if you could please raise your hand, we can direct the microphones towards you. 
So we have a question in the back. <coughs> and if you could please uh, stand, state your name, and the organization who you are with. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much. First of all, my name is Nicoletta Pavese. I represent uh, Syngenta. Um, in case you don't know, it's a large agrochemical company. We provide seeds and crop protection, and we've been in Zimbabwe for many decades. My question is to do with the command agriculture scheme. Uh, we hear that you are planning to restructure it or somehow change it. And I was wondering uh, how the government is planning to encourage a more transparent uh, procurement process for inputs for the new scheme. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, let's take two more questions. If there are no other questions, I will be forced to ask more myself. I'm not sure anybody wants to hear more of me speaking. Yes, we have a question right here in the middle. Yeah, Mr. Finance Minister, uh, welcome to Switzerland and thank you for hosting us. My name is Jean-Francois Groff, I'm with Mobino, a mobile payment company here. And I was wondering, uh, in all confidentiality, of course, what is the view of government today towards um, mobile payment or digital payments in general for the country? How does that relate to the introduction of a new currency? Do you really think you need to print paper at all? And should the government be in control or would you let the telecom operators run the show as they do in other countries? Okay. Two, two very good questions. Uh, is there a third, and a third question right here in the front? Lars Bonner at Farland Capital. Um, I'm going to go in a little bit, so back to the technical questions. I, um, I read the IMF Article 4 from 2017 on my way here, and they interestingly compare the official GDP with, which is around 25 billion, with their estimate at the time, if you apply the parallel currency, which at that time would be around 13 billion dollars. But that obviously applies to government revenues as well. And my question to you is, if you depeg the currency, what type of government revenue in US dollar do you expect? Because the official estimate now in the budget, if I remember it correct, is around 20% of GDP or five to six billion dollars. 22%. 22. But obviously, many of those revenues are in terms of electronic dollars, not dollars on your Nostra account. So what type of sort of base case government revenue should we work with when we assess your debt repayment capacity? Thank you. The three very good and difficult questions. Now, on um, uh, command agriculture, mobile payment, and then the government numbers in terms of uh, uh, currency and so on. Now, on command agriculture, uh, uh, you know, command agriculture is necessary. It has been necessary. Why? Because Zimbabwe had to deal with the issue of food security. You know, I look back and say, we have got El Nino right now. We have got a, a, a climate challenge. Were it not for the 500,000 tons of grain that are sitting with the grain marketing board, uh, we'll be in trouble. We have enough food to see us through a drier season. So, so it is really serving its purpose ensuring food security, and that, that is a good thing. But what, what we notice as government is that the, the private sector, there is not enough private sector participation in one or two companies. We'd like to see more companies, and that was my earlier point, that once you see more companies participating, once you see the banking sector doing more, and, and we've said that with Treasury, we're, we're happy actually to, to offer our, our guarantees to banks that lend to farmers, that lend to the program, because we want to ensure food security, make sure that we crowd in the private sector. It becomes a truly PPP a, 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 a partnership. Uh, I, I thought that the procurement process on command agriculture was transparent, uh, but you, you seem to suggest that maybe it, it, may, it, it may not. Uh, but, but it is, I think it was very transparent for those who are operating uh, in the sector. Uh, and in fact, what we have is the exact opposite, that we don't have enough private sector play, uh, players, and we are urging them to join the program, 
because we think this is a good thing. Now, um, uh, coming to the issue of uh, uh, mobile uh, payments and so forth, oh, we, we support that. In fact, as I said earlier, you must never waste a good crisis to push the uh, mobile bank uh, in the form of uh, eco-cash and others, uh, eco-cash dominates, because that solves the, the transaction challenge of not, not having a fiat currency or run, running out of it. Uh, that, that will continue, it has to continue. As you know, the central bank's uh, monetary policy objective function it goes beyond, at least it will definitely go beyond the normal inflation and growth imperative, but also include the financial inclusion, which is what uh, mobile banking is about. So, so we like it, we promote it, we support it. In your question was a, a sub question about the model for mobile banking. Is it bank led or is it uh, uh, telco led? Uh, in, in, in Zimbabwe, it has been bank led uh, because you know central banks always. Uh, what about the ability to then uh, manage this uh, entity uh, uh, if it doesn't fall within the financial sector? If it's a telco, the central banks don't regulate uh, telco, so they worry about that. Uh, but uh, for what it's worth, uh, I'm not sure that I want to try it as yet as a government official, but in my early work as an academic, I, I used to argue that perhaps the best way to regulate mobile banking is through a college of regulators which is uh, the central banking side, uh, telco side, and also the consumer, kind of consumer uh, awareness side. You need those parties around the table to, to, to effectively uh, uh, regulate the, the sector. But not that we have a problem with it. Uh, if, if you are bank led in your, in your uh, mobile banking, you know, you know how it works. You set up your trust account with the bank. There's a see-through by the central bank. So there are, there are all issues uh, around regulation. And even if it was telco land, uh, uh, again, we, we, we know how to do that, as, as they do in Kenya, where uh, you know, Safaricom uh, uh, drives it. And, uh, uh, and even in other countries such as the Ivory Coast, where the trust laws are very different from our Anglo-Dutch or, or English system, then uh, we'll figure this out in Africa, I tell you, when there's no issue about, about the model. Then, then coming to the figures, uh, uh, no, we're very comfortable on the figures, uh, I tell you. You, you see, uh, uh, as you know, in this kind of uh, uh, my business, it, it's a game of ratios. My job is always to get the ratios right. Uh, uh, so I'm determined to maintain the same ratios as you see in our staff monitoring program when we formally uh, uh, announce uh, uh, the macro framework. Uh, we were able to maintain those figures without uh, uh, difficulty, even including the, the salary increases that, that will come through in the next three months. Uh, uh, you know, it's which negotiation season in Zimbabwe uh, threatening to go on strike. It's normal. But I'm pretty relaxed about that. <laughs> People must push for their rights. Uh, I, you know, that's okay. Uh, so, so, but again, we, we, we have an idea as to how, how high we can go and wages, we have parameters. And hopefully we'll be successful in containing everything within that uh, and making sure that we still meet our ratios uh, within the S&P uh, program, even under a new currency regime in another 12 months, say, will be able to, to do that. And by the way, I can assure that your, your, your fair old friends in the IMF, they pretty much know how we think about this, and I don't think they differ in the way we have uh, you know, concluded how, how, how to proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, just to justify my presence uh, on the stage. <laughs> Um, there, there's a matter that uh, the minister um, and have touched on, which affects uh, business um, activity uh, in Zimbabwe, which I hope, Honorable Minister, uh, it can be the next um, for attention uh, in your uh, reforms, uh, which is tax. Uh, Zimbabwe is one of the uh, highest taxed destinations um, you will find because of the, the base of tax uh, currently is uh, the narrow uh, source best uh, and we are now one of only eight countries in the world left uh, uh, with that base. Um, so there will be need to migrate to 
the more global tax system that uh, everybody else is on, uh, with the consequences of the reduction in the number of taxes to simplify them, uh, as well as in the rates of taxes to allow uh, existing businesses to uh, replow the savings into uh, production and to attract uh, foreign direct uh, investment uh, based on uh, sensible returns. Um, and, and I think that if we look at uh, uh, the sighting of Zimbabwe on the African map, uh, it has natural attributes to become the next uh, financial center and tax destination. Um, you are within six hours of any part of Africa. Um, it's the gateway into, into the region. It is the best climate and we have heard about the HR um, attributes of, of the country. So to the minister, the teaser is, is this something which is uh, on your radar? Um, to the investing public, this is an opportunity to enhance the prospects of you investing in Zimbabwe. Thank you. Maybe additional contributions? And I can then join in and try to address. If anyone wants to. There are any other you want to kick in on, on house too? Yeah. Well, maybe I can just add a quick point in the interim. Actually, in the very back of your presentation, you'll find about a 16 page document that's attached that actually includes investment opportunities in Zimbabwe. So, if there's any questions after uh, today's event, obviously please take a look there. There's contact information listed, there are ways to get in touch with the members of the panel. So you are certainly not left without a lack of opportunities. So if there's any other questions from the audience, yes, we have a question here in the front. Please mention about the innovators and people of companies here. I, I exhausted my questions in the previous uh, session, so thank you, Honorable Minister. Just a request, and, and this one is related to visas. It, it seems like a small point. But for those of us who run global organizations, sometimes deciding to get into a country and the ease of getting a multiple entry visa for a business person makes a big difference, particularly if we're bringing a significant number of people. So just making it easier, I don't know who makes the decision that business people or even tourists uh, can get multiple entry visas that are five or 10 years. Between the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Home Affairs, <laughs> you know, uh, visas, and then I'll come back to one guy. You want to go with it? Well, I was going to see if there's any other oh, questions that we can additional take in the interim. Any other questions? All right, if not, I'll add one more question uh, to the list from myself, and this is uh, to get the panel more involved to Mr. Cumberbatch. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the Zadira sanctions. Obviously, I think a lot of people in this room are quite upset with the timing of the extension of the sanctions that were signed last, last August, really on the heels of the events of October, or sorry, of August 1st. I think my personal belief and the belief of many others I've spoken to were if the extension had come, say, two months earlier or two months later, there would have been a sort of structural break from the events that we saw, and maybe those sanctions wouldn't have been extended. Now the question is, are there plans being put in place to work on having those sanctions removed? And if so, what type of a new investment environment and environment and relationship with the international community could we expect going forward? Yeah, no good question. Thank you uh, very much indeed for that. Yeah, look, Zidera is there. It's a fact of life. It's been there for quite some time. Uh, it was uh, amended uh, shortly before the elections um, and I think we have to take a positive view of it. The senators, the Congress people who were involved in getting that amendment through, which actually relaxed Zidera a little bit, um, I think were motivated in, in, in a good sense. They were trying to help, trying to encourage 
before the election even, <coughs> trying to encourage uh, the incoming administration to uh, deal with a number of issues which have been on the cards for quite a long time and which have caused uh, problems, you know, between ourselves and the uh, and the United States in terms of our relationship. The sanctions that the Americans have put in place are hurting. They are hurting. Uh, and have done so for, for quite a long time. We have been criticized uh, a lot as a government for failing to really engage the Americans on, uh, on, on these sanctions issues. Um, in uh, contrast to perhaps the way we have engaged and continually engaged the Europeans. The Europeans also have what they call targeted measures, we call them sanctions, they call them targeted or restrictive measures which are in place but which have gradually been relaxed over the years as uh, the Europeans themselves had seen progress being made on the, on the ground. Um, the, if you read through Zedera, it's like a checklist. You, they're, they're looking for a, a, a significant number of reforms in very, very clearly identified areas. Uh, the minister has made reference to some of those areas in the presentation he made. Uh, it's basically in, into, you can categorize it into a number of different uh, areas. One is uh, economic reform. And I think the fact that uh, the transitional stabilization program, which was introduced in October last year, and the budgetary, uh, the budget statement made uh, by the minister, the 2019 budget statement, I think has set the path for economic reform and it's been well received by the Americans has been well received by uh, the Europeans and uh, others who previously have been quite critical about uh, the way we do things uh, in Zimbabwe. So that's the economic reform. Then there's political reform, political and legislative reform. And this is an area where the Americans and others have been pushing us for quite some time to make progress. Um, I hope it's nothing I said. <laughs> uh, and where they continue to, 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 to put pressure on, on us. Uh, the two pieces of legislation which the, the minister mentioned, which is uh, IPA, which is uh, access to information and the protection of private uh, property, uh, and it's basically about media, um, uh, freedom of the media, freedom of the press and freedom of expression, that sort of thing. And there are two other pieces of legislation which are associated with that, which is the Broadcasting Services Act and the Zimbabwe Media Commission Act. Those are three pieces of legislation which the Americans and others, but it's specifically mentioned in Zidera, need, need review. Uh, um, and then there's also the Public Order and Security Act, which is basically freedom of association, freedom to gather, freedom to demonstrate, um, to come onto the streets and, uh, and register a discontent with the government policy or, or whatever. Um, and again, uh, the Americans and others, and it's specifically mentioned in Zidera, they're looking for us to make, uh, to, to, to progress with uh, reforms there. That is, is, is ongoing. It's, it's not an easy process, uh, this kind of reform. Uh, and if you look at the events of just last week, it strengthens those within the system who are perhaps less, uh, less happy about moving uh, towards reform and saying that if we dilute our laws and we relax our laws to the, uh, you know, to the extent that others are wanting us to do, then uh, this kind of thing that happens uh, last week when you had people in the streets and you had some, uh, some very nasty scenes on TV and, and, and elsewhere, uh, it strengthens the hand of those who, who want to move rather more slowly. Uh, and that, that then feeds the lobby in the United States and elsewhere, which says that things are not moving in Zimbabwe. They're not, the change is not coming at the speed or to the depth that we would want, and therefore we need to re retain these things in, in, in place. But things are moving. We are moving, as the minister has said, uh, there is, uh, principles have been uh, identified by the line ministries. They have, are ready to be presented to cabinet. Once they've been approved by cabinet, these will go into the parliamentary process. We're on the board 
this has given us assurance he will uh, whip everybody into line to make sure that we uh, that, that that process goes quickly uh, and until we make progress in those specific areas I, I think it's going to be very difficult for us to see uh, the Americans relaxing on, on, on the sanctions again what we saw in the streets of Harare last week and the headlines uh, <coughs> There's a political agenda there, which I'm sure is obvious to everybody. There was quite a lot of pre-planning that went into the, what happened on the streets of Harare. It was time to coincide with the president's uh, visit to Davos. It was time to coincide with the uh, beginning of the process uh, which the European Union undertakes at this time every year to review uh, the sanctions measures which are in place against Zimbabwe. Those sanctions come up for renewal, or the restrictive measures come up for renewal in February, but the review process starts last week. And so what happened was not uh, a coincidence, or it, it wasn't just happenstance. There was a, a planning element uh, involved there, really, to, to keep the pressure on the administration in Harare. Uh, <coughs> I don't know if that answers your question, but it maybe provides some sort of insight. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so we have one more question on the visa issues. Which From a legislative point of view, I was fortunate to meet uh, Congressman Flake Coons, who are some of the leaders in this uh, Zidera initiative. And this was before elections. And we cannot focus on the negative and not the positive. Because we then expose ourselves to the agenda. Let's talk about the pre-election environment. Nobody ever wants to talk about that. But immediately, 1st of August, we all focus that on that. Zedera, who does it hurt? Ladies and gentlemen, let's all sit here. We are all business people. Is it the targeted people or the ordinary citizens? We, we've got to be very clear. The targeted people who are the so-called targeted are not hurt. Mugabe got into power. He went out of power. He still went to the UN. In America, he was targeted. It never stopped his salary. He never stopped his allowances. But the ordinary person suffered. I'm a legislator. Why hurt the ordinary person? We are but one world. And today, you continue with it. It's the ordinary person suffering. The ordinary person suffers the protests. Protests which are initiated by the very same people who've targeted you know, the people that we believe are the front runners for non-democracy in Zimbabwe. We now talk about protests again. From the pre-election, 1st of August, we now go into this, and Ambassador Komapek was very clear. I think if you play the game for too long, people start to understand and appreciate. And my clarion call, to the investors who are sincere, is that what resource are you looking for in Zimbabwe? What are the impediments? Yes, the impediments from a business point of view are too many taxes. One point, stop, Zeta is coming through to deal with the businessmen coming in and ensuring that whatever paperwork needs to be done is done on time. The foreign currency, and I think, Minister, you must equally address this, that people <laughs> investing in Zimbabwe, will they get their money? Yeah. I think this is where the issue is. You invest in, do I get my money back? The indigenization law, the current president changed it. That you, there was an outcry that we put our money in, and 51% goes to government, I get 49. It's been relaxed, we're not talking about that. So are you really after business in Zimbabwe or are you after politics in Zimbabwe? Let's come clean on this. If it's for business, 
that has been relaxed. The minister is able to say to you, put in your money, you will get it back. Which business person has come into Zimbabwe now and has put their money in, has not gotten their money out? And also pre 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 prescribe the shareholding that you want that suits you. And I think the president has done that. The Americans, for me, I'm very honest with you. The president is a reformist, is the leader of the nation. But at times I think, you know, he's kind and uh, he's accommodating. I wouldn't. Those who want to come and do business in Zimbabwe, let's look at what business environment there is in Zimbabwe. The Americans don't give us that much. They're bullies, that's all they are. And because America has sanctions on Zimbabwe, the whole world stops to go there. Yet Zimbabwe is more peaceful than some of the nations that they're in. They talk about human rights violations, but they're in Iraq killing people. Is that not human rights violations? I'm a legislator and I've got to be honest and speak with my heart to you. They don't kill their own, but they kill others. But are those that are killing not human beings? Who talks about it? I'm emotional and it's unfair for us to paint Zimbabwe bad when the bullies of this world continue to kill innocent people for the resources that they want. Come to Zimbabwe, invest, put your money, come out. You've got more planes going to Zimbabwe in the morning. The morning plane from South Africa, which is Ailing, if you jump on it, has got more whites going into Zimbabwe to do business and they get out. And none of them have never been hurt or injured in any other way because we're a peace-loving nation, educated nation, which wants to see our country prosper. Thank you very much for that very passionate response. Uh, based on my personal experience, I can absolutely attest to that. It's a beautiful country. I've never felt in danger there at all, and I'm very excited to return. Uh, unfortunately, I have to pull it back a little bit because we do still have one question on the visa issue. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to the ambassador and uh, maybe the finance minister as well. He, he will talk okay. on my behalf. <laughs> well, well uh, just quickly about the visa, it is a purely technical issue. Um, Zimbabwe migrated from the visas that are normally issued at uh, embassies or, or overseas missions to online visas. This is where we are now. Uh, but we find that the online system is impersonal, or impersonal go. So there are sometimes then uh, issues to do because you're just applying online and people are dealing with papers. But sometimes you have to talk to people directly, especially for multiple entry visas. So we are now moving to a, a system where we have both online applications and also visas issued at the embassy, where we assess a person, you know, this is a genuine business person, they are, that they qualify for a multiple entry visa, you know, that kind of thing. So, so most, most countries now have that kind of dual uh, process. So this is where we are going to now. I can't give you. Uh, the timelines, but uh, this is a matter that we have discussed, um, foreign affairs and immigration, and is under discussion. I thank you. Uh, from a personal point of view, uh, in terms of the visas, we, uh, we recently have made uh, a large uh, investment in Zimbabwe, uh, and uh, we, we, we're mobilizing uh, all our contractors, and the visa issue was dealt with uh, well, and uh, we haven't had any issues. And in terms of all the other, some of the other issues in terms of the currency, in terms of uh, one getting dividends out uh, as an investor, we've covered all that and we worked with the Ministry of Finance and we found solutions to all of the issues. Um, and uh, the, our financiers are, are happy with the solutions that we found. And I think that if investors do come to Zimbabwe and they spend time uh, with the relevant ministries and uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, that their concerns will be addressed as ours will. Thank you. Then 30 seconds on Money Guy's comments. Uh, certainly, we're determined to simplify the fiscal regime and uh, going forward to simplify the taxes. We're currently doing various simulations to see how to do this. Get rid of some taxes, lower some taxes. Sometimes just raise more revenue by lowering you know, VAT and all of that. So, we're doing those simulations. We'll be cleaning up and simply simplifying the tax regime uh, going forward. One uh, a sub question, you know, question was, 
uh, of the an international you know, financial center to make sure Zimbabwe becomes a truly you know, a gateway into, into the region, into investment. We are determined to do that. Once the, the one-stop shop has been established, we'll take it to the next level, which is then becoming a fully functional offshore investment center. I, I agree with those, those, those ideas, absolutely. So unfortunately, we have run out of time, but I do have one final question, and this is for the Minister of Finance. In a one-word response, if people put money in Zimbabwe, will they get it back? Yes. You've heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> you will get it back. So with that, I'd like to thank my panel, the Minister of Finance, obviously, the Ambassador. There's also a few other special guests that we need to acknowledge for all of their contributions for today's excellent event. That's New Africa Capital, ABB, the Swiss Africa Business Circle, and a particular thanks to Herr Ulf Schwarzenbacher, the owner of the Dota Grand, which obviously I think we can all agree is a truly spectacular venue. So with that, I'd like to... And also, again, thank you for all of those who attended. This event obviously wouldn't have taken place without any of you. And again, if any of these challenges that we talked about today wind up being solved, it's because of people like you who came to events like this and actually started to push these problems and challenges forward. So with that, I conclude. Thank you all very much. And I'm sure the rest of the panel will be around to answer any additional questions as you can find them. Uh, they might try to escape, but just pin them down, ask them the tough questions, because I'm sure you'll get the response that you want to hear. So with that, thank you very much.